Again, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today's session is on brewing with efficiency. So I'm going to pass it on over to our local guys to take it on. Take it away, Spencer. Thanks, Nicole. <clears throat> uh, my name is Spencer Tilkemeyer. I'm the East Division Lead in Brewing Innovations Lead for Yakima Chief Hops. I uh, live in Chattanooga, Tennessee and uh, work remotely with brewers in the eastern half of the country and also with our brewing innovations team to, uh, to focus on uh, innovations and solutions for, uh, for brewer issues that we see out in the marketplace. I'm a former brewer and joined by another former brewer uh, on staff here with YCH, Blaze Rude. He is our director of key accounts and brewing innovations and Blaze and I work together, uh, as I mentioned, on a team uh, of uh, sensory lab and, and uh, technical brewer uh, folks that <clears throat> that's uh, specifically focused on on uh, kind of uh, working with brewers out in the market to uh, to deliver solutions wherever we need them. So uh, we're joined today by a pretty star-studded uh, panel of of brewers. We're here to discuss uh, discuss uh, the different ways that they strive for efficiency in their breweries. Um, Nico Tonks uh, joins us from Minnesota. He is the co-founder and longtime head brewer at Fair State Brewing Cooperative and in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. A former brewing colleague of mine as well when we both brewed together at Live Oak back in the day. Um, he also runs their pub, and uh, which is a seven barrel system in downtown Minneapolis um, and makes some damn fine lager beers among other things. Uh, Brent Cordell, Cordell or Cord Cordell, I I'm sorry Brent if I mispronounced that, is um, is with us from Odell Brewing Company, where he has been for over 19 years, a very long standing career there with a very prestigious brewery. Um, he has worked in both uh, the production and pub side, and uh, he spends most of his time as the brewmaster at the Rhino Brew House, but has worked in the larger facility in Fort Collins, and, um, and has done a little bit of everything with Odell through the years. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, talking with him, and he reminds you uh, to wear your mask because he currently misses spending $12 a beer, $12 on, on one beer at Coors Field. So never thought I'd say that, but he hopes to be back watching baseball very soon. Um, we're also joined by Zach Turner. Um, he's the head brewer and co-founder of Single Hill Brewing in Yakima. Hopefully a lot of you out there have had a chance to visit, visit us in Yakima and sample some of Zach's fine wares. Um, <clears throat> Zach also is the former technical solutions director for Yakima Chief, where um, we got to work together for a brief time. He's a uh, tremendously intelligent individual with lots of, lots of creative solutions for all sorts of things. Um, every time I go into Single Hill, I feel like I learn something new. So we're uh, really grateful to have Zach here. And then finally, last but not least, we've got Brandon Morris, who is the Director of Brewing Operations for Creature, Creature Comforts Brewing Company in Athens, Georgia. Um, Brandon has been with uh, Creature Comforts for six and a half years, and he currently um, manages all aspects of their production. Uh, for two different facilities, one of which just recently came online about two years ago. A pretty immaculate uh, brewery that I got the pleasure of seeing not too long ago. So welcome guys, thanks for being here. Really looking forward to kind of chatting some of this over with you. And uh, very deliberately, we wanted to have brewers of kind of all different shapes and sizes here. Uh, some of you work on, you know, smaller pub scales up to, um, you know, really, really large uh, production systems. And I think that's one of the focuses of this panel is to discuss the ways that you can utilize efficiency. A lot of people think of efficiency as a, something that's isolated to larger brewers, but I think um, all the folks on this call have different strategies for how they, they work toward efficiency, even in smaller settings. <clears throat> so I'm going to keep this to being a pretty informal roundtable, but first, uh, before we get started, I wanted to offer just a quick definition of efficiency as we'll be discussing it today. Um, I, I, you know, efficiency can mean a number of different things, I think, in a brewery. Um, yield is obviously the most, you know, the one that comes to mind most quickly, uh, just producing more beer uh, with less effort or less raw materials. Um, but I think for a lot of us on the craft side, there's also the possibility of creating more flavor with the same amount of materials or, or even less materials. So more flavor or the same material using less, uh, less hops or less grain or things like that. I think there's also uh, something that we often overlook, which is uh, labor and safety, sort of the, the human elements of, um, of efficiency. Basically, how do we um, create the same beer or better beer with less labor, uh, with less risk uh, to, the, to our employees? How do we make things more safe as we, as we grow and scale things? And then also uh, novelty, kind of that, <clears throat> that sort of wild card element of 
how do we use um, creative, efficient ways of brewing to create sort of novel elements in beer, whether that's more flavor, different flavors, um, things that we hadn't thought of before. Um, so efficiency, I think, for the purposes of this discussion is a, a dynamic topic and we'll let it be pretty open-ended. Um, in some ways, it's kind of a look at how we innovate to make beer more, make beer better um, in, our, in our breweries. So. so with that, we'll kick it off and I'll start uh, by discussing something that I think is uh, familiar to a lot of brewers, but also something that everybody is, as far as I see, pretty uniformly trying to get more out of. Hot side uh, creativity. How, um, basically, how do you guys work to get more flavor in creative ways? Um, you know, what's, what sort of hot side strategies are you guys using um, that you feel like either help you make more beer, better beer, get more hop aroma, hop flavor into your beers? Um, anybody have any thoughts on that topic? I can start, I'll say a fast knockout is what I like to do. At a big dose, knock out fast if possible. And I've always been plagued by that problem in like previous breweries that I had, I always took an hour to knock out and trying to figure out how to do that faster, uh, I've found helps with flavor for my beers. Yeah, especially important in places that don't commonly use cold liquor tanks. I was I grew up as a brewer in Texas and where everybody had a cold liquor tank. So it was kind of astounding to me when I went to a brewery where people were knocking out with groundwater. In fact, it kind of blew my mind. I had never considered the, the concept. So for those of those brewers throughout the world that do use groundwater, perhaps employing like a two stage system or something like that. <clears throat> um, anybody here use use like a two stage chiller to, to like kind of you know, help you do loggers in the summer or get a quicker knockout, anything like that? No, we, we use a CLT and we have a massively oversized heat exchanger just as kind of an accident. Um, it does let us knock out pretty fast. And then uh, we also do a lot of pre-cooling. So almost all of our hot side additions we do at 185 degrees or so. Um, we put virtually nothing in um, for flavor additions at a, a higher temperature except in some loggers. Um, everything else is getting kind of a cool pool or a cold whirlpool um, before we put all the hops in. So that's nice for us. And every once in a while we throw hops into the fermenter too and knock out onto those, usually hot, to let them kind of bloom with hot wort and then knock out cold on top of them after a couple of minutes, which sometimes is, is, has a pretty nice effect. And uh, it feels like it kind of eliminates some of those sort of concerns I might have about repitching yeast off of a fermenter edition um, hop. And it's pretty easy and pretty clean if you're using cryo. You don't end up with a lot of sludge in your tanks. Do you have so trouble? We do. do. you have trouble with blow off on those beers? Uh, the few times we've done that, it's made a god awful mess. We don't, but we don't tend to have really big uh, blow over issues with our beers generally, um, just from relatively cool fermentations. And when we're putting fermenter hops in at the very beginning of fermentation, it's always cryo, which I think just has less of a it has less chunks, the, the lupulin in there just kind of, it settles out more likely than it floats and comes out the, out the top of the tank. Yeah, it makes sense. We did, we did, we made a beer last year with uh, an awful lot of um, fermenter hops and uh, it was, it was for a different purpose. Um, but yeah, it was, we, uh, we averted disaster narrowly by, because uh, the tanks all blow off via the PRV or the, the spray ball. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we avoided a uh, narrow disaster by, <laughs> by uh, diverting to blow off through the actual little top of the tank instead. Um, yeah. We had that happen last week on a fresh hop and it was a mess. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so. um, to answer the question, I think that one of the, the things that we've really done related to efficiency on the hot side is just try to figure out exactly, especially on the two different systems, like where, where the, the, the break even um, point is on wort loss uh, in the whirlpool, uh, with, so just trying to really dial in what the loading looks like, what good looks like for us in terms of, you know, pounds per barrel in the whirlpool. Um, and it, it turns out that there's a, for our, our 30 barrel brew house, there's a pretty narrow window, um, where we can hit, where we're, we're basically not wasting any, any work. So we, we try to build, uh, build hop loads in, in all of our hoppy beers. They, per barrel, they all look pretty much the same because, um, it has made a huge difference in downstream uh, for us to really get that right. That's really interesting, Mika, because we do something super similar on our 85 barrel system. 
where we, a lot of our beers, a pound per barrel, because that's what it makes. That's where we get our best yield. What we'll do is we'll layer in different concentrates and it's basically a pound barrel T90 equivalent. So like if it's freezing concentrates or cryo or extract, we can go up to whatever that would equal in pound per barrel of T90 equivalent. We'll also play with some of the pre-cool on some of our beers, but interestingly, we pre-cool less of our IPAs, more of our lagers, so we can get mops into the lagers without making them better. So it's kind of it's the opposite on those for us, but it, it's fun. Yeah, I can second that. We do about a pound per barrel and everything. Um, one other thing we've added is a really large, like a pretty high capacity strainer right after the kettle, uh, which really is just sort of, at this point, it's, it's back up if we really overload the whirlpool and we're carrying a ton of, ton of hoppy trube into our heat exchanger. It just makes cleanup a lot easier because um, I can pack a strainer instead of packing the, the heat exchanger. Um, Yeah, I'll add to that, Zach. Um, we've had some uh, challenges with those uh, Whirlpool additions in the cool pool uh, jamming up our strainer often and have uh, kind of shifted some of those additions more to the fermenter. <clears throat> and we're lucky to have the, we have a hot back as well. So we're able to kind of use that as a strainer slash, you know, another another layer of hop aroma as well. So that's a, a combination of the two seem to help quite a bit when we're doing heavier loads in our Whirlpool to uh, help uh, avoid jamming up our strainer too much before the heat X. Yep. Yeah, I like what you guys said too about, you know, utilizing, uh, you know, chilled whirlpool strategically, not just for the idea of being able to retain more compounds. We've, I've, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, people, some people really, really believe they're capturing more compounds. Some people don't think so as much. We've tested it a little bit in the internal brewery and, I've had kind of a mixed bag of results, interestingly enough, but I think maybe one of the main features of it that I like a lot is that you're able to add in, a, you know, a substantially higher pounds per barrel rate of hops without adding so much bitterness, which, you know, in an age of kind of low BU IPAs and lagers, like you said, Brandon, you know, you only, if you only have, you know, 20 to 30 BUs to play with, that's not a ton of room in an age of relatively high alpha, alpha hops to use quite a bit of whirlpool hops. So, you know, the ability to pre-chill a little bit is, is kind of nice because you can, you can exceed some of those thresholds without getting, getting way up into, you know, higher BU ranges. So, and I, I do often find that a lot of brewers underestimate how much they're getting from like unchilled Whirlpool additions. Those BUs tend to be higher, I think, than most people think they are. And so, um, so yeah, that, that pre-chill can really help knock some of that down, uh, which is cool. So. When you guys are chilling, are you doing it by blending cold water back or actually running through heat exchanger or what's the methodology? We do both. Um, usually at the end of, end of boil, we do a gravity correction with cold water, which just does a little, just that helps us hit our gravity um, with other variations in the process. Brings the temp down maybe 10 degrees at the most. And then we have a heat, dedicated heat exchanger just for the whirlpool. It's a big shell and tube. And, um, than just during the normal whirlpool. So we're not adding any process steps or like changing well, the way we do it. It's just the normal flow path goes through a shell and tube. We take off another 10 to 15 degrees on that in the standard like, standard duration of a whirlpool. So, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on what the starting temp was. And uh, that's how we do it. So it's, it's kind of integrated to keep it simple. We've tried both and on, uh... On our system, we'd have to add way too much water to make it, to get it down to And then on the small system, we're not efficient enough on that system to be able to water. We can't get enough grab out of it. So we will recirculate through a dedicated heat exchange for the lactic, uh, lactic acid beers on the large system is nice. Although it's not a tube, so it clogs if you have any hot side additions, which is not fun. But um, <clears throat> we'll also just run through our other heat exchanger and then a quick hot rinse through it after before we go and knock out to the cell. So generally just using the heat X, but. Yeah, that, uh, that Zach brew house is pretty tricked out. I've, I've seen it myself. It's that shell and tube built in is pretty nice. Probably not something that everybody has, but they're actually not super, super inexpensive or super, super expensive in my experience. So it's something that could be potentially added uh, in some people's brew houses if it was, if they were regularly doing something like that. But um, yeah. 
for those people uh, who, are, who are considering doing it on a small system, I was very surprised by how much cold water I had to add to the, the yeah. seven burn whirlpool to get down. So, you know, do some, do some math, do some thinking about it uh, before you try it the first time. Yeah, dust off those thermodynamics books. Um, well, uh, if, unless anybody's got any more comments on that, we'll move to a different question. I'm going to ask a, a few specific questions here. It looks like we got one in the, in the Q and A though real quick that I'll, we'll answer. Please explain blow over. I'm a large brewer. I think by that, they just, these guys just mean uh, basically that the fermenter, the, the, the croitin from the fermenter is escaping through the, either the blow off arm or the, or like the CIP arm because the uh, fermentation is vigorous enough and the, and the level is high enough that it's uh, gassing out the top of the fermenter. Is that correct guys? Yep. yep. And then uh, with that, Spencer, right, that's probably because there's more nucleation sites added because you didn't whirlpool and get the hops out. It's in Adam straight in the fermenter. Is that kind of the theory behind that, guys? Does that make sense? I mean, my specific concern was literally just hop matter being transported up into the Krausen and literally just clogging the outside of the spray ball, <laughs> building pressure and blowing the PRV. Um, oh, that, was, that, was the, that was the doomsday scenario that I was trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be gnarly. Uh, yeah, okay. I thought you meant the other way. I thought you were saying that the hops were causing it to blow over more. I would, and I would have maybe expected less because it, you know, the, you know, some of the fractions should theoretically help with uh, knocking down head. But, um, but anyway, um, it'll make a pretty nasty cap just floating at top of the tank. Uh, yeah. It can be pretty thick, and then the, the crowds is helping to basically float it up higher and higher and higher. So, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm gonna pop around with, to to each of you to ask a few questions that are like specific to to you guys' um, setups. So, uh, Brent, you know, you've as we mentioned, you've worked on you know in your time with Odell all sorts of different sizes of systems, things like that. So you've kind of, you know, currently you're working on a smaller system, but the, you know, the last time I was at Odell, which was a lot of years ago, you guys were, had just installed some 400s and I imagine that there are bigger tanks than that at this point. So as you get, you know, larger and larger, um, you know, the, the reality of getting on like a scissor lift or, you know, God help us like a ladder or something like that is like less and less viable as time goes on. And also just the, you know, terms of labor hours, like, you're doing four, five, you know, 600 pounds of dry hop in one tank, like the idea of lugging it up, you know, from like a manual perspective is a lot harder to imagine. So how do you guys kind of scale and be more efficient about like your dry hopping procedures, sort of the labor and both labor and safety efficiency as you guys have gotten bigger on the production side? And do you have any tips on even the smaller side too? Um, well, on the, on the larger side, as we've gotten bigger, you know, we're always thinking, um, when we're building recipes from a R and D standpoint, um, we're thinking of, you know, 11 pound bags, 22 pound bags. So that helps be efficient, I guess, as far as, um, you know, making sure that you're, you're grabbing 44 pound boxes and it just, you're not having to weigh out a lot of different, uh, random amounts, I guess. So that's one thing we concentrate on. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it is a lot of hops. Uh, we have not, in, uh, we don't have any bigger fermenters in the 400s at this point, but, um, we, once we got those implemented, we had to uh, figure out a different way. We weren't going to climb outside in the winter and start popping the top and dumping box of the hops in. So we, uh, we got a hop cannon and that's been um, really efficient for us to be able to uh, load that thing up. Um, I think we can probably hold around probably about 60 to 80 pounds at, at one shot. And it's just kind of a, you know, it's, it's a pressurized vessel with a pretty oversized outlet on the bottom that we'll just able to, uh, you know, charge with CO2 and blast those hops up to the top of a, of a dry hop port, basically that's, that's uh, ran down from the top of the fermenter to the bottom of the fermenter cone area. Um, but yeah, uh, we're not really climbing up on fermenters anymore with the, doing the ladder thing. We're not doing the scissor lift thing anymore. Uh, most of our heavily dry hop beers are going to be going into those 400 so we can utilize the, that hop cannon. Um, I, I think we have experimented a little bit with, um, a little bit lesser amounts of hops and actually recirculating our fermenters after post dry hop to kind of homogenize all those uh, pellets and oils more efficiently. Um, I'm not sure if that's a standard practice yet. Like I said, I haven't been up in the, in our main brew house for a couple of years now, but um, I know uh, we did play around with that a little bit and saw some pretty positive results. So it's just a matter of 
weighing in that extra labor and if, it, if it's actually worth the, uh, you know, the flavor profile improvement that you're going to get. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's really helpful. And I think that's like a really good point to make too, is that like, sometimes as craft brewers, I think we act like, uh, you know, like the flavor gain is the, is the one and only parameter that we're trying to improve. But like, I think there is a, there's a trade off there, or at least a point at which we have a second, third, fourth, you know, parameter, which is like, does it add enough extra flavor to make it worth three hours of extra, of extra like pump sani, sani and tear down and, you know, and, and procedure and tear down or does it increase risk to the employee, you know, does, and all these other things, right? So there's a trade-off there that, you know, that I think uh, is worth considering when we're, when we're designing recipes. Obviously we want to make better beer, but sometimes like, you know, less exposure to, to potential, you know, contamination and less labor and all these other things are like, are worth the, the trade-off. But um, you bring up a, a good point for the, or a good topic for the group though, which is uh, dry hop devices. I'll just say devices, you know, you said it, you've got a cannon, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, the, the market is full of all sorts of, of devices of many different types, uh, torpedoes, recirculation devices, um, you know, shear pumps that are deliberately designed to like shred up hop, you know, hop pellets and, and get them introduced into, into the beer. Um, what is the group's feelings on dry hop devices? Do you guys, you know, love them, hate them? Do you find that they really help? Um, a favorite type? Um, and we get those quest types of questions a lot from customers and I think it, a lot of it depends on your application, but any thoughts on that? I'll go. Um, Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, we we currently don't have a, a dry hop device other than a scissor lift and a cellar person. Um, we, we've trialed out a few of them uh, for us you know, at this point, so for, for reference, we made, you know, between 10 and 11,000 barrels last year. So not making a ton of beer, um, but making, a, I don't know, a good little chunk. And all of our fermenters are, are 90 barrels. Um, just the, you know, the cost that it was going to, that we would incur to, to get one of them, just like the, the ROI was better on, on a lot of other things that were higher on the list. So we just, we haven't gotten one yet. Um, the thing that we're, that we do, uh, that, you know, just from being on the hazy panel last week is maybe more rare than I thought it was, um, is we, we do a fair amount of uh, dry hopping actually before we hit terminal gravity um, on, on beers that we're making uh, and, and really sort of have come to rely on the, the mild recirculation that we get uh, due to that little bit of fermentation happening after we're adding it, um, which, you know, makes yeast management more difficult. Uh, but so for us, that's essentially what we do. The second dry hop is, or if it's a single dry hop beer, it's um, it's a static dry hop with some CO2 rousing. But for us, because our tanks aren't aren't that massive, um, it still works pretty well to do it kind of the old fashioned way. Yeah, our situation is pretty simple. We only, we're a small brewery. We have 15 and 30 barrel tanks and we just open the top and add hops. And, uh, then close everything up and give it some rouses over the next couple of days. And we're mostly dry hopping at, at the end of fermentation, maybe a, a little bit of residual activity and our yeast stays active for a while um, during dry hopping, regardless of what the gravity is when we dry hop. So yeah, we don't, we don't do too much. Yeah. I was going to say, we're a big fan of the can as well. We've got those 304 oil tanks. They're four or five feet tall and we don't have a cap. So there's really no other option just blowing them in with CO2 on those. Um, and we've started using for the 120 dry hops as well, even though they have a port, just because I was the person to work on the ground, we are the thing, you know, it's really nice to go there and just do this and still load them onto something else. And, uh, but it was a significant and a learning curve. Honestly, it, can, it comes with um, ball valve on it for some reason. That doesn't work very well for us so we re retrofit with a nice big, big butter valve and learn how much else we could get in in each charge and just kind of play with it until we got a, a way that that worked well um, but so far so good yeah I'd, you know sounds like everybody's gonna got <clears throat> a similar opinion which is like the simplest thing that gets it done for you safely and and efficiently you know um i think Oftentimes, uh, when I'm out in the market, I do see some brewers sometimes that are using a device 
uh, with, with like a lot of excess complication and it sort of seems to like obscure the end goal, which is just like to get them in there, to get them evenly dispersed and to get them eventually back out of there so that, you know, you can, you know, get your beer to the, to the packaging process. So I think the name of the game is just like whatever, um, whatever gets them in there very simply and easily and with the least amount of exposure and, and effort and labor safety risk, things like that. So, um, uh, oh. I'll chime in, Spencer. I uh, definitely am in, am in the camp of like, I don't really like to pump finished beer uh, a whole lot or extra, but yeah, dropping it in the fermenter has been what I've done mostly. Uh, uh, what I would do if I, you know, was running a 15, 30 or plus barrel brewery would probably hop cannon. What I really like about that is if you do want to dry hop active, it's not a closed system, but you don't have somebody up top going to get hit with a hop geyser on top of a scissor lift. So, I mean, I definitely have played the game with dropping the hops in, clamping that, and uh, probably bung. I like I like to drop them in and then bung the tank and manage pressure uh, from there. So, but the, with the hop can, I think it, it's increased safety because you're down on the ground. The valves are down there. Probably not going to be a hop geyser geyser unless it comes out, you know, the the airlock. So. It's, it seems a lot more manageable, and that would be how I would design my brewery if I was going to build a bigger one. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Blaze. Uh, active firm dry hop is a thing that we talk about a lot, and I think from a research perspective, the more that we do on the brewing innovation side, the more I believe in it. I, I, I'm really a fan of it. I think it accentuates a lot of good things in hop character, and it diminishes some bad things sometimes. Uh, but it's worth noting that it does, it's not without its challenges. And I think, you know, one thing that should always kind of go be understood uh, when we are recommending that is that you're taking very ample caution when you're adding hops to active from beer because the, the, the risk is real. And there's plenty of videos out there on the internet that show people getting blasted with hop cannons. And hopefully you're on, if that ever does happen, you're on something very stable that, you know, but um, yeah, you could get hurt for sure. So um so I, I like what you said blaze the, the closed system and the the, the lowered risk uh su substantially lowered risk of being up in the air when uh something might be coming back at you out of the tank so yeah. you ever feel a cold whoosh of wind coming at you from from out of the fermenter port close it up immediately <laughs> not not great but uh anyway so uh yeah so uh, i appreciate that guys that's, a, that's a, those are good thoughts um um Brandon, a question for you. So you, you guys, you know, at Creature Comforts have Tropicalia, pretty iconic brand. And I, I don't know what percentage of your sales it makes up, but I think maybe more than anybody else on the call, I think if you were going to like, you know, put, talk about a brewer who's like really, really known for this particularly iconic brand, you guys have, have that brand that that's really well known in the market. Um, and so, you know, you guys have gotten a second facility now, you've got this really uh, beautiful, sophisticated brew house, bigger centrifuge, all these other things, right? that uh, help you make more efficient beer, but you've got this, you know, this brand that people have really come to, you know, expect in the market. How much are you willing to tweak a brand like that? How much are you willing to play with it? How much are you willing to try to make it better? You know, if it can be better, how much are you willing to mess with it, you know? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, honestly, quite a lot. Over the six years in general, we're willing to tweak it a lot. It, it's always, it's something that we do carefully. And I think kind of not to beat the fancy horse, but it also has to be done efficiently, right? You can start changing things and say, we're going to hop it different this time here that's everyone knows what it's like, who's drinking it on a regular basis. It is, you know, and it's about six of our sales. So it's, it's a big deal for, uh, but it pays to have a train sensory panel that's very, very good with the beer and have lots of different strengths and weakness to taste it as you shift. And just coming to uh, we Southern Mills is our production facility where I am. Just coming here, um, just the nature of brewing it on a different system, it, it changed so much. And that was honestly a little wracking when it happened. Tropicalia had some bittering engines. It had some things in it that we had to remove. So some of us adding some concentrate and then realizing we may not have needed, you know, taking out a bittering addition and having just to be a whirlpool here, even though it's kind of a more, not old school IPA, but it's kind of a bridge between, you know, some West Coast IPA and some juicier um, 
and it's been it's been really interesting. And even now, play with it more to try to get some of those yield increases. So after a couple years, we're feeling really comfortable with where it tastes. So now it's like, all right, what can we do to match the flavor year over year as our hops change, as our lots change? But also, what can we do to make it a little more just actually efficient? So can we layer in more concentrates and use less volume and get more out of the whirlpool? And then can we um, also manage the top? and make it time efficient. So for us, we got hit with you know, just the beginnings of total creep madness, right as we were scaling up 340 barrel tanks, probably went from 12 days to 20. And so getting that back down to a 12 day beer a long process, that was, that was pretty great. And, and one of the things that helped was adding some concentrates into the dry hop to they decrease some of the available that was there to get re-fermented off or enzyme that was kicking up fermentation in the fermenter. So we do kind of, we talk really closely, but we do tell us pretty often with Tropicalia, especially on the hops, on the hops. Side. So we're, we're trying different things in there. We're trying to tweak what's going on, but we're not trying to change the beer. We're just trying to make it a little, um, a little more in, in either time or in volume of material that we have to use in there. Yeah, that's, and that's, you know, you bring up a, a really key part of efficiency. It's like not just yield, it's uh, days, days in the fermenter, you know, residence time is like a huge portion of like, you know, shave off one day in a facility as large as you guys, uh, you know, turn time, that's a major, you know, that's a major gain. And so, um, you know, a lot of, you know, you bring up a topic that's like plagued uh, a significant amount of brewers over the past few years, and, you know, probably for longer than probably for longer than that and longer than we were really paying attention to it as an industry, you know, but um, hop creep is something that a lot of people deal with globally. Um, you know, and you said that, you know, while you guys were at kind of the peak of it, you were, your, your residence time had gone from 12 days to 20 days, which is huge. That's almost, you know, that's like over an additional 50% uh, days more than that. Um, so how does the group um, as a whole do, you know, do you experience hop creep? Does it really affect you significantly? How do you, um, how do you mitigate it? You know, like Brandon mentioned that they've had some success using, uh, you know, concentrates. I know that we've, you know, we've talked, you know, offline about using some cryo and that seems to really, you know, uh, help mitigate some of it because of the diminished enzyme content of cryo. Um, you know, anybody else in the group um, have any strategies for kind of how they tackle that? I've been doing a bit of trials here in Yakima and at my old brewery. Uh, Uh oh, Blaze, you cut out there. I don't. Know. Can everybody else hear? No. Yep. Uh oh, Blaze, your your mic like just kind of went off there for a second. I don't know if you want to try it. Okay. Okay. I'll keep going for a second because the you know we're open about this because we're trying to the brain trust and learn from every much as we can. We also use LDC now, um, alpha lactase to help us finish a little faster. We found that the right combination of really good yeast health, very good monitoring of kind of when you're going to dry hop, ALD usage, and a little bit of concentrate, like the magic number for us. Dry hops are all warm, so there's always potential for it to keep fermenting because we don't really like the flavor of the cool dry hops in our beers. It's kind of, it's a, once we were using ALDC, the mash temperature became a point that we could also control again. So it's timing between when you dry hop and then when you want to finish based on where your temperature is. So for us, it's dry hopped above terminal, let it come right on. Hopefully we clear VDK the same day and then we're out of there. So two or three days on the hops and then we're done. But it's been, it's been a tweak that took a couple years to get just right for us. We are fortunate we don't see hop creep in our brewery. Um, that's probably because of the yeast we use and that makes things pretty convenient. And I used to work with Brent at Odell too and we didn't see hop creep there. And that I was aware of, I was the quality manager and managed sensory at that time too. And the team was pretty sensitive to, to diacetyl and, and nobody, nobody was frustrated by it back in 2012, 2011 when I left there. You definitely know, we're seeing it now. <laughs> Are you seeing it now? <laughs> what do you guys do? We're adding a lot more hops than we used to. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah, we've been kind of countering that and just trying to find that sweet spot. I, I do think a little bit of cryo blend in with some T90s does help alleviate that 
that creep and it's just uh, it's just tricky because not all those you don't want all cryo some of these varieties you want some of that t90 some of that uh, plant matter can really uh, add complexity to that hop and um we're just trying to we're still playing around you know on uh, r&d side of things still trying to figure out the sweet spot of the right blend and what kind of hop creeps we're going to get um but it's usually i mean and rhino i'm usually seeing hop creeps if i'm doing about you know four pounds per barrel or something that on a on a ipa i'm seeing it creep for at least a week and trying to keep that under pressure and just kind of keep an eye on it bleed it off when i need to but um yeah it's just it's an evolving uh learning process right now i was going to say we we definitely experience creep um you know i think that part of our sort of methodology for dealing with it is just anticipate it build it in um you know it's not too bad for us i think i do think that you know getting some of those hops into the fermenter a couple of days before we hit terminal um you know doesn't necessarily mitigate it but it mitigates the effects of it a little bit uh, in the sense that you know that's happening while fermentation is still going on and maybe it's getting us to the end more quickly i think the point about having really good viability and, and really healthy yeast is very important i mean i think if you've had kind of like a crappy straggly fermentation uh you know creep is going to be a bigger problem um but yeah just you know trying to anticipate it on the hot side a little bit and and, and messing with with mash temps and because it's the biggest thing for us was not necessarily even time but just the the you know the difference we were seeing in the sensory profiles of the beers if they were drying out um further so you know it's a it's a moving target um and i don't think we've really don't have a magic bullet uh and certain varieties are much worse than others um but luckily on our you know we've sort of through a, a constellation of different factors been able to kind of tamp it down in our core brands anyway where we don't we don't have to worry about it tacking on more than a day or two at the most. So. Yeah. I should say we do see re-fermentation. We just don't fight the VDK portion of it. So after dry hopping, we, if we're pretty close to where terminal should be, we, we tend to see half a plate over. So in almost all of our beers, and we've actually kind of come to rely on that to sort of spun the tank and it helps, it gives us a lot of our, a lot of our carbonation. Yeah, we also don't notice big VDK spikes. I mean, not that we're doing any sort of uh, uh, sophisticated testing on that other than just sort of a classic old school force test. Um, it, that was definitely the case with the yeast that we used to use previously. We, we did have some downstream problems in package, um, but the yeast that we're on now, we have not, haven't experienced that. Thank goodness, knock on wood. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I should be clear. You know, we have a couple different yeasts that we use. One of them makes a lot of acetyl, our house yeast will make a lot of acetyl in the right circumstances. But luckily, we're also centrifuging. So if we can get it out of there, we get the yeast out of suspension. Once we're clear of VDK, we're very confident we're not going to get more downstream and that we're not going to produce any more in the package. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's a moving target. It's, it's crazy how complex it is depending on yeast and hop type and everything else that's going on. Yeah, from a, like from a, kind of a more of a hop side of things and like sort of the research that we do internally, I, there's there's really a ton of, of kind of dense um, kind of concepts that are packed into this one sort of experience that people are having, hop creep. I think when you really peel back the layers, there's a lot to it and there's a lot to it <clears throat> that really is, um, um, that really affects, I think, not only just like the fact that there may, may or may not be VDK, there may or may not be additional fermentation. I actually think that uh, the creep itself, uh, just the act of having for a little bit of fermentation going on can actually affect the way the dry hop is perceived too. Sometimes in beneficial ways, I actually think like, like Nico mentioned, I'm, I'm a big believer in having some yeast activity or at least very viable yeast during your dry hop. Like you, several of you have mentioned having a really viable, um, you, know, cell, you know, like essentially really healthy yeast, maybe higher cell counts or whatever during your dry hop. Because I think that um, a beer that's uh, essentially void of activity has a potential to concentrate, especially at the rates that we hop these days, concentrate some less desirable flavors from hops um, when it doesn't have the ability to kind of have a little bit of fermentation activity to gas off some of the more uh, hydrophobic compounds. So, um, but from a research side, we're, we're actually working on a method right now by which we hope to be able to um, <clears throat> dial in the, basically like the, diastatic potential or like the the uh, starch degrading potential of a given lot of hops. You know, Nico mentioned that like certain certain varieties seem to be worse than others. We 
we see that all the time. You know, anecdotally, we hear that certain hops are worse than others. Um, we're definitely at this point not not even close to being able to um, like determine what if there's like a field practice that we could change to mitigate that or maybe a kilning practice. You know, there's some theories that maybe we could change that stuff. But rather than going down that road right now, the first step would be to be able to just measure it. You know, what is the me what is the potential of a given lot of hops to degrade starch? You know, how and, and at least give that give a brewer that piece of information that that warning um, that they they can see it coming. They know if there, there's a, a lot that's particularly high um that they can just anticipate it and not be blindsided by it so i think sort of the awareness is like step one and then downstream if we've or, you know or maybe upstream is a better way to put it if we find someday down the road that there is a way that our that our farm practices can affect it um we'll have to make kind of a communal decision as an industry if, if that's something that we want to uh modify or if we'd like to keep things the same and just kind of uh, manage it on the brewery side but um yeah, it's a it's a very dynamic uh, dynamic issue. But um, anyway, sounds like you guys have got a pretty good handle on it. Um, Spencer, do you want to address the open question in the Q and A kind of results? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if anybody can't see it, it says efficiency to me includes harvesting yeast for future use. Are you able to harvest yeast from beers where you dry hop prior to terminal gravity? If so, what type of viability to use do you see? Um, so since I guess I'm, I'm the poster child here for dry hopping before terminal, um, I'll, I'll answer that. It definitely makes life harder. Uh, we really try to build, so we've done a lot of work to try to get all of our non-loggers onto one yeast strain so that we have more donor beers. Uh, we do make, we have, so let's see, we make three IPAs year round and a pale ale and only one of the, one of those four beers has that pre-terminal dry hop. It just so happens to be the, the brand that we do by far the most volume of. Um, so trying to juggle yeast around so that we're not taking out of, um, taking out of that particular beer, uh, is, is a little bit of a headache. Uh, and it, it definitely is a downside. I would say it is, is like net negative for efficiency and there's kind of no two ways about that, but, um, that this is where the, you know, the old, as you said, Spencer craft ethos of like the flavor is everything kind of, um, kind of trumps, you know, other stuff. Yeah. I mean, it does really. And I think every, every beer drinker, every fan of your beers would probably thank you for it. Like I, I said, think it's nugs, you know? Exactly. I think, uh, I'm a, I'm a believer. I, but, uh, and I push it on people all the time, active from dry hopping. I also am not the one that has to manage their use day to day. So it's easy for me to sit on a, to, to, uh, to say that, you know, as a recommendation for how to make beer better. Managing yeast is a challenge. We have, you know, we have brewers out in the market that that have the ability to cultivate a fresh pitch every time, whether that's from a, you know, from a dry yeast pack or whether that's a, an actual in-house prop um, that they're able to do each, each and every batch. If you have the ability to do that, or, or if you're building a brewery right now and you have the ability to plan for that, I would say you put yourself at a tremendous advantage if you can. Um, but also like the, like the guys have mentioned before too, yeast strain uh, seems to have a significant effect on how some of these things, um, you know, manifest themselves in some of the downstream problems. So, so yeast in, in initial strain selection, I think makes a big difference. Um, anybody else have any harvesting tips for uh, beers that have been dry hopped or things that you do to manage it? I was going to say, yeah, I, it's late. Oh, sorry, go, ahead. go for it, Brent. Well, I was just going to say real quick, our, our IPA is our yeast source. So we, we have to maintain it. Uh, Tropicalia is the main source of yeast in our brewery. Um, and it's pretty, for us, it works out pretty well to harvest on day four or five. The beer is pretty much done fermenting, but it's still a little above terminal. And the yeast, honestly, is already going to, by the time it's at full terminal gravity, it's going to start using up its inner doors and start degrading in quality if you wait that long for us. And so what we found is that it's really, really good to get it off and get it cold as soon as possible, as soon as it runs out of the easiest food to eat, and then we can store it for up to a week. Um, and so we try to harvest day four or five, dry hop day six, get the beer out of there two or three days after that. So we've developed a good rhythm. But again, you're right, it's yeast specific. But I think we found that just pulling it off before it has a chance to completely run out of a food source keeps it pretty healthy. Valuability stay pretty high. I'm going to agree with what Brennan just said. Um, I'm going to add for the small brewers that maybe haven't looked into this. If you add pressure to your tank at that time, it helps get those yeast to settle in the bottom and you're going to get a better harvest and get more of the yeast out. But I still think there's plenty of yeast in there to deal 
with the hop creep that you're going to encounter after dry hopping and they're fine to leave in there but yeah kind of a warm harvest routine there's some hearing a lot of good success with that healthy viable yeast and really pay attention to how you store them don't uh don't let the, the tanks get warm or build too much pressure. You want to make sure you got a vented tank to uh, if you're going to store them for a week, in, in my experience. Yeah, and also keep the O2 out of there when you're harvesting into your vessel because you give yeast a little bit of oxygen and it thinks it's about to get fed. It starts using up its glycine stores and then it dies two days later. So well-purged vessels really help, especially when you're storing large pieces of yeast. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. And I, as Nico said, I think at the end of the day, the beer profile that you're looking for might, might be your guiding light, you know, and, uh, and you kind of figure everything else out after the fact, but, but it's, uh, I did talk to a brewer in Arizona who was working on a way to get their brew, their beers to reliably blow off, um, you know, basically high Kreutzen out of the, out of the arm. And he was working on a way to be able to harvest it in a sanitary fashion from the arm. And it's something that I had considered for a long time when I, the last brew that I ran, I never got around to actually trying it. You would ha definitely have to dial in your, your knockout volumes every single time. But I think it's a pretty sound thought if you, if you could actually, you know, get it to work, you know, every, for you every time. If you ever miss, I think you'd, you'd have a rough go of it. But, uh, but at least until that, uh, some of those English breweries are running on like their 10,000th generation of the same yeast, you know, because they top crop it or whatever, theoretically. So it's worth a thought. But um, anyway, yeah, um, good you question. The, you need the research pump to keep it from flocking every 35 seconds, but you know. That's, that's true. Thing. They have a lot of specialized equipment over there, yeah. so. Um, good question though, and I encourage the audience if there are any questions to keep, keep, keep them coming. Um, <clears throat> Zach, uh, so you're, as you've mentioned a couple of times, your brewery is a little smaller, so your, your flexibility is a little higher in terms of like, you know, how much you have to uh, be consistent with a single brand all the time or anything like that. However, I think you've done a really cool, you set your brewery up in a really neat way to be able to kind of in, have maximum flexibility, maximum batch diversity within a, a relatively small amount of brew days per week. Um, so that's like, you know, it takes the form of splitting batches, uh, you know, fruiting different batches a certain way. And a part of that is your experimenter skid, um, which is a really neat kind of uh, Zach Turner TM invention. Uh, but you want to kind of explain that piece of equipment and how you use it and how you uh, try to get more from more beers from one batch kind of? Sure. So yeah, what, what uh, Spencer's talking about is we have a, we have a skid of three five barrel tanks that are all piped together into one unit, essentially. Um, the benefit there versus three five barrel tanks is it just helps on the back end for cleaning and sanitizing them. We can, we can CIP all at once. We can, fill all at once, we can purge all at once, um, which just makes them makes it more efficient to actually use them for um, for projects, I guess, versus just using them as little five barrel tanks one at a time, which I think you're also prone to do if you have a brewery, you, you have a tank, so you fill it with beer. Um, but because this feels like one 15 barrel tank in three pieces, we use it as a 15 barrel batch, usually doing three different things. And, um, more when we started it was mostly being used for splitting uh, fermented beer so we'd ferment a 15 barrel batch in one tank and then run it in through the drain of all three of them at the same time so we end up with three completely identical like base beers and then did that to play with different hops hop combinations or hops we hadn't used in a long time or hadn't used ever um, just playing with dry hops um, then we've been using it for a fair number of fruited things just like taking a whole batch of kettle sour wort out of the whirlpool and transferring it into all three and then fermenting it um, in an identical fashion. You know, it's pretty nice because it fills all three tanks at the same time. So you get the same amount of troop carryover, you get the same, um, you know, you we're pulling the same volume out of the whirlpool into all three simultaneously. So the starting wort really is the same. Uh, so we can do fruit on there. Um, yeast trials are pretty fun too. You know, we experimented with changing up our core yeast because it doesn't have great flocking characteristics. So we struggle to manage yeast sometimes. So we tried a couple other strains side by side in our main IPA. And uh, then we discovered some really uh, great things about our yeast and <laughs> that we really liked for the flavor profile and we stuck with it compared to some other things. Um, 
where we weren't getting as much free fermentation and we were getting weird sulfur compounds coming up. So it's allowed us to make do some experimentation. You know, our brewery is young. We're only about just over two years old. So our first couple of years were pretty heavy on those sort of experiments, I guess, trying to figure out what worked for us and what we enjoyed drinking and if we could optimize or tweak. And now, to be honest, it's sitting idle probably more than I expected um, as we're just we're kind of cranking out batches and we're doing a little less experiments. You know, last year at this time, we had them packed full of fresh hop beers. Um, so we were making just a ridiculous quantity of fresh hop beers by modifying them in the fermenter. Right now, there's one fresh hop beer in it and we're using it to blend barrels. You know, uh, it's a five, they're pretty handy five barrel blending tanks basically. So we've, we've been keeping one open for that a lot of the time just so we can kind of mix and match. Uh, is that a question roughly, Spencer? Just kind of describe that. Yeah, I think it's like, it's cool to just like kind of just the dynamic nature of having, like you said, it's essentially for all intents and purposes, it's three five barrel tanks, but having them all together kind of forces you to think about how you can utilize, you know, them as like a, as you know, exact same word, exact same beer, single variable change or double, or, you know, maybe more than one variable change. And the neat thing about it, like I, like you said, is that you're not just drawing like a heavily tubed bottom portion of the kettle into one tank and the, you know, like a really, you know, clear portion of work from, from the top of the kettle into another tank, you're actually filling them all at the exact same time, which makes them truly a, you know, a, a apples to apples comparison. So, you know, for our purposes, you know, we work together, you, you know, it, to, to, to trial different hop combinations and stuff like that. It makes it ideal for, for those purposes. And uh, yeah, we I really one with you guys recently. That was pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On that one, we really learned that the, I think we learned, maybe you guys felt the same way, that the base beer that we used had such an intense hop profile that all three were pretty similar. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I remember seeing the report. I didn't drink them myself, but the report uh, showed, it showed some minor variations, but probably not as much as we would have expected initially, you know, after that. But um, so, uh, yeah, it's a neat concept. I I really enjoy those yeast-based experiments, like you said, too, because it, it often can teach you a lot about the yeast that you already use um, just by way of, you know, trying something different side by side with it, so. Yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit on variables you can tweak there, because you do have a really clean starting condition. You can just change temperature if you want, change how you find it, change day of dry hopping. Um, yeah, pretty neat for process tweaking. Um, we've got about left uh, I'll just encourage one more time if there's anybody in the audience that has questions I'd feel free to to shout them out that we could on the on the chat function or the, the Q&A function so that we can get them answered before uh, before we let these guys go uh, in the meantime I'll ask a question to Nico and this is this one's fair game for anybody who uh, who has something to uh, contribute to but Nico I know just you know when you guys transitioned from the pub to the St. Paul facility that uh, the addition of a centrifuge was one of kind of the major, major you know, process additions there. And it, and it did change kind of the way you guys make copy beers and stuff like that. Brandon, I know you guys have added a larger one over time. Brent, I know I've seen you guys before and I'm sure you you guys have probably upgraded since then or, or you know, are using them in multiple facilities. How did that change, Nico, the way that you guys make copy beer? How did it change the process by which you, you know, dry hop anything like that? Did it, did it change parameters? Yeah, it changed everything. Um, well, what's what's interesting is that it, it's sort of the two things have kind of grown up in parallel because we really didn't actually make that many super heavily hopped IPAs before we opened the big brewery. Um, and now now we make them at both breweries. So you can really see the differences side by side. And I don't think anything that we do is, you know, super special or anything. So it's, it's benefits that probably everybody is, has seen and, and maybe these guys know more than I do because, you know, probably running a lot more through the fuse than we are. But um it helps. I mean, I, the obvious big lift is is yield. You know, we're getting a lot more back uh, than we were uh, without it. You know, our through various tweaks and trials and messing with it and just really trying to max out the hot side and um, so on and so forth. Uh, Mirror Universe, which is our sort of core beer that we make the most of, is you know five pounds per barrel. It's an awful lot of hops. Uh, and so it's a 90 barrel batches and we're regularly yielding, you know, 83, 84, sometimes as much as like 88 into the bright tank, um, which is great. Um, and the fuse, you know, is, is huge for that. Uh, we're not able on our scale anyway, it hasn't seemed worth it to actually blend tank bottoms 
on those beers, uh, just because there's so much chunk and gross stuff in the bottom of the tank. Uh, we, we are able to on um, other beers that, you know, have either lighter hop loads or, or no, no fermenter ads where we're actually able to, to drain the entire tank and, and, and uh, effectively separate uh, yeast uh, and other true um, from the bottom of the tank. Um, so that's one benefit. The, the other benefit is time. So we're, we're able to have beers crashed for fewer days um, and end up with a more rounded finished product that we're happier um, sending out uh, than when we are not able to centrifuge things. So hop burn, especially with these super high dry hop load beers is a huge issue where to my taste buds, they're very, they're not palatable at all and sometimes pretty gross, um, you know, when they're coming straight off the, the hops. Uh, and so when we do seven barrel batches, I need to build in you know, seven or 10 days total, hopefully maybe across two different vessels to really get the, the beer to be kind of rounded out. Um, the centrifuge allows us to do that in, in one day. And, and frankly, this is weird, but it is true, um, you know, because we, we do most of the business in St. Paul goes through distribution channels. Um, we've gotten, I've gotten personally comfortable now with the point of you know, even if the beer does have a little bit of hot burn in it when it goes into the bright tank, I know it's not going to hit the distributor for another four days, and then it'll take a couple of days to get into market. So if we're seeing seven to 10 days in the can is really where the sweet spot for these haze bros is, um, then we can kind of build that in on the on the front end and really just just get stuff out. Um, so that's, that's also an, an interesting thing. But, you know, it, that to me is actually has been the biggest benefit is being able to produce beers more quickly that taste finished and well integrated. Um, and that aren't just a, a hot mess. Yeah, reducing variability seems like really huge because it seems like it can be pretty variable uh, without it and stuff like that. And I know breweries have complained about that prior to having a having a centrifuge that on the on the same day every time they can make sure the beer feels polished and finished and stuff like that. So, well, and in the in the haze marketplace, you know, there's it there's there's potential for beers that be getting out there that are pretty messy. Um, you know, and, and we really actually would prefer that all the yeast is out of the beer. Uh, and so that, that's another, another big thing where we can, you know, our, our timing and, and the, the physical appearance that we want in the beer, as well as the sensory stuff, the fuse really helps us at the nexus of all of those points, really just nail, nail things consistently. That's, that's really well said, Nico. I think I agree with everything you said. It's, it helps so much with consistency and just nailing it especially with the haze it's you know you can you can spit some of the haze out if you're not careful but if you have it dialed you can get such a more refined product i think quicker out of uh, by using the centrifuge for sure and again it's yield obviously and we've even found now with a small buffer tank addition where you can run the first bit that's usually pretty cloudy into a buffer tank, let it sit for a little while while you run the rest of it, and then run that back through the fuse with the rest, with the tail end of the beer. You can get even more out of it. So, really, nothing. I don't have anything bad to say about it. It's it's a great tool. They're just expensive. Brent, do you have anything to add to that? You guys have been using one for quite a long time. We have, um, and like I agree with what these guys are saying. Uh, we've been kind of uh, playing with the idea of uh, moving these beers a lot quicker now. We used to still let them have, you know, their proper like three week tank time, which a lot of our beers were. Um, and we've uh, been trying to spin those beers a lot earlier in the process to maintain some of the, we just noticed that we were getting a lot brighter hop characteristics the earlier we were spinning beers, you know, of course, after they were finished. But um, uh, I think, uh, like I said, I've been up there for a couple of years on the, on the cellar floor, but I know we were, we still do, meter in quite a bit from the cone, even on our IPA. Um, but some of these newer brands with the uh, bigger hop loads, I'm not too sure if we're, we're attempting that or not. Um, might be a couple heavy drainings before we, we attempt that. But um, yeah, the fuse is definitely a huge advantage when it comes to getting that beer in the break at a high, high consistency quality. Blaze, you see a lot of breweries that are rather rather sizable and use a lot of centrifuge action. Any anything else you want to add? Uh, I'll second what the crew's been saying about consistency, like consistent haze, kind of managing that. They, for a lot of the breweries I work with, they they don't necessarily want the brightest bright bright beer, but they don't want it hazy. So using the centrifuge really just helps them maintain that. And from what I hear, is 
helps keep the flavor, hot flavors in particular, in the beer compared to finings or filtering. Yeah, it seems like a pretty magical tool. They were not, uh, the la by the time I was a, uh, uh, my last head brewer job, they were just starting to get to a size where we could have even considered it. And, uh, now I see brewers of like really, you know, pretty much all sizes, um, above a certain threshold, at least, um, utilizing them with great effectiveness. They seem in some ways, almost like a magic bullet. Uh, it's a quite a, it's quite a nice tool to, uh, to refine a lot of, uh, sort of the rough edges of, of green beer and stuff like that. So um well very good uh team we're uh, we're right at about an hour here um no uh no additional questions from the crowd i'm sure we're going to get some after the fact if anybody on this call or anybody watching it after the fact would like to ask a question of this group please email brewinghelp at yakimachief.com and we'll make sure to connect uh your question to the right person uh, whoever that may be uh brewinghelp at yakimachief.com and uh I think that that pretty much covers it. Thank you everybody for uh, a really great panel for, uh, for joining us today. And um, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you guys in the very near future and having some uh, fantastic hobby beers at each of your various places. So thanks very much. Happy harvest season. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, Thank thanks you. again, Thank everyone. Okay. Um, before I let you guys go, just a quick reminder for those that were on the call. Uh, we did record this session and it'll be up on Virtual Harvest and Hoover app here, hopefully within the hour. Um, and like Spencer said, um, if you do have brewing questions, brewing help at yakmachief.com, or if you have any other questions for other sessions, as well as just generic questions about Yakima Chief, uh, feel free to email brewschool at yakmachief.com and we will get those to the respective parties. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank all of you guys, your panelists. Uh, you guys are great. So much amazing information. Um, that's it for us. Thank you guys so much and have a great rest of your day. Cheers. Thanks. Adios all. Thanks, guys.